So let me pray for us. Father, we are grateful for the opportunity to come together to learn a little bit about your word, this scripturated word, the Bible, and hopefully with that to learn a little bit more about you and each other and our place in the world, to stretch our minds, to think differently, and to think um, in, in, a, in a holy way, I hope, um, a ways that we can be about your business as representatives in this world. So help us this morning. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. All right. So my three minutes that I gave to that are over. This And now it's 10 minutes later. That's great. <laughs> That's what I kind of expected to happen. Yes. Talk fast. Oh, I have no idea how to do that, Bob. Um, wow. All right. I have a feeling that was an insult somehow. Okay. So here's what we're going to do. Um, first of all, I want to give a caveat to this class. We're doing Rethinking Genesis, the primeval history. The primeval history means the first 11 chapters of Genesis, right? My hope is that I will, at least half the things you hear will be new to you. Okay, which means they will be scary to you because new is always a little bit scary. All right. But if you hold on, hold on to your hats, just hold out the nine weeks. I'm hoping I show you this, honestly, a more robust and beautiful scripture and a gospel that just pops. Now, I think the gospel that you know clearly, it's I'm not going to change the gospel. Don't worry. All right. It's beautiful and it pops. But sometimes you're just so used to it, you're just like, yeah, Jesus saved me from my sins. Isn't it great? But it doesn't, like, you don't see how it all comes together all the time. And so that's what I want to try and do. I want to make some, some touch points for you, some hyperlinks, some allusions to the Old Testament that run to Jesus. That's, that's my hope. We won't do that every week, but we're going to do some, we're going we're gonna to dive down deep. All right. But in order to get there, we're going to start in 1977. Great year. Do you, can you all picture where you were in 1977? Every single one of you was here, was around in 1977, right? One person? Okay, two people not here in 1977? Three, four, five? Okay, five. I just wanted to know whether how many people were younger than me or older than me, so that's helpful. There are five people younger than me in this class. Where are the youth? Where are the young? Okay, anyway. All right, so this phenomenal thing happened in 1977, and if you disagree, if it being phenomenal, then... I mean, honestly, now is the time for you just to pick up your stuff and leave. I'm just, this is, it's, it's that kind of serious. Are you ready? I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to go ahead and, when, when I heard this sound, when I saw this particular thing happening on the screen in front of me, when, uh, I got more stories to tell you, but when this happened, my life changed forever and some of yours did too. Are you ready? Do you remember this? Did this change your life forever? Just lie to me. Oh, stop. I said lie to me. All right. So you know what's happening right now. There's a crawl, and it's famous to Star Wars, right? This crawl that comes across and starts very wide, and then it gets smaller and smaller and goes away, and it tells you this political story that you're like, I don't even remember what the political story is. All you remember is there's cool lightsabers and things like that going on if you remember anything about it. My life changed on that. Well, actually, I wasn't allowed to see it in the theater. So a year later, probably when I actually saw it on VHS or wherever it was on TV with commercials, anything like that, everything changed. So uh, by 1980, uh, sorry, by 1978 or so, Christmas morning, I'm this little kid. I'm walking out to Christmas Eve, to Christmas, sorry, to, Chris, to Christmas morning, Christmas trees, you know, stockings hung by the chimney with care, whatever's happening right there. It's like six o'clock in the morning, like all children should come downstairs, right? Wiping their eyes and looking and seeing. On this. And in the darkness, there's no lights on yet. In the darkness, little Darth Vader is standing there six foot tall in my living room, right there. Gotta be honest, peed a little in my pants, all right? This is, this is like sprint into mom and dad's room, jump on the bed in between them, they're freaking out. They have no idea what's going on. I'm like, oh, so they get it. They're kind of laughing. They're kind of, but they bought me this huge cardboard cutout that was standing up there. It's probably worth a thousand dollars now if I'd kept this piece of cardboard because uh, apparently Star Wars kept going or something like that. It became kind of big. All right. So there's this, this political thing that's going here and I'm, I'm ignoring all the politics of Star Wars. And it's filled with it, right? The empire has done this. The rebel forces have done this. That's all, that's all politics, okay? Genesis 
I might even say the Bible is about politics. It is about this crawl. It's not about who you should vote for, okay? I'm not gonna argue whether, I don't know if it's gonna be Trump and Biden again, whatever, no conversation there. It's about who's in charge. It's about who's king, who's Lord, who are the ones that we're supposed to follow, okay? That's how Genesis is gonna start. So instead of thinking Star Wars when that comes up, okay, I want you to think creation wars. Okay, so this very first chapter is this story about a war. My guess is probably most of you have come to Genesis and never seen this as a war. There's a battle going on here. Now, it's not an actual battle, okay? It's a literary battle. It's not even representing necessarily things that were really happening. I'm not saying that Genesis 1 didn't really happen. I'm saying the war aspects didn't really happen, okay? But it is a, a literary war. It's a, it's a conflict that, um, that people, the people who are writing this, the authors of this, are trying to win a battle with propaganda. You know countries who do that, right? In fact, I don't even know any countries that don't do that, okay? including probably ours, right? We, we warp things just a little bit so that we know that we're the best right? Or Russia's the best, or China's the best. Whoever is writing the propaganda gets to win. So propaganda isn't automatically wrong. It's just, instead of using the word propaganda, let's get rid of that. We'll call it ideologically motivated rhetoric, right? They have a particular viewpoint that they want to get across. Their particular viewpoint is that Israel is best, Yahweh is best, and I want to persuade you of the same thing, okay? That's why they're writing this stuff. So there's a motivation. Paper's not cheap, right? Ink's not cheap. It's real cheap now. If you want to write something, you can do it in your spare time, okay? And it won't cost you a thing. Back then, you don't do that kind of stuff. So this, this is very intentional, everything that's happening. Okay, so creation wars. Here's the, here's the political crawl. They, they call that, that, you know, as it goes in Star Wars, they call that the Star Wars crawl. It's, it's moving, the words are moving. Here it is. It says, Rebel forces have been completely decimated by the empire. This is not the Star Wars one. This is the Genesis one. Rebel forces have been completely decimated by the empire. The gods of Babylon have conquered the so-called God of Israel. The people are lost, exiled, dead. But the prophets continue to come, and they continue to hold out hope. A new generation is being raised in the dark lands of Babylon's gods. But hope is essential. The elders hold out hope to the young and the fathers tell an old story with a new purpose. Okay, do you need me to read that again? This is pretty exciting. Okay, thank you. I love this. Ah, yes, good. Rebel forces have been completely decimated by the empire. I need you to hear where this is coming from. So who are the rebels that have been, can be thinking about, I'm gonna tell you all these things, but just to think about, who are the rebel forces? Who is the empire in this? It's not Darth Vader. It's not Hoth, you know, the bad guys, whatever it is. The gods of Babylon have conquered the so-called God of Israel. You know what those gods are. You've read about them a lot in the Bible. The people are lost, exiled, dead. Okay, that's the same language. Okay, I'm not saying that they're lost. They're also exiled. They're also dead. I'm saying that's the same word. I'm just using different words to explain it. Lost, dead, exiled. That's a pretty important key to watching through the entire Bible, because when it uses words like lost, dead, exiled, sometimes it means the same thing. Just because you're going to be killed doesn't mean you're going to be literally killed. It might mean you're going to be exiled, okay, or you're going to be lost. So these are the things that are happening. But the prophets continue to come, and they continue to hold out hope. And you see, if you look at the entire Old Testament, you see prophets, right, from the, from the early prophets, which is... Uh, Joshua, Judges, Kings, and, um, and Samuel, okay, those are the early prophets, and then the late, later prophets are the 12, plus Isaiah, Jeremiah, Ezekiel, they hold out hope. A new generation is being raised in the dark lands of Babylon's gods, but hope is essential. The elders hold out hope to the young, and the father tells, fathers tell an old story with a new purpose. So the story is actually really simple. It's the story of this, this epic war that is waged before man comes to be. Before there is mankind, there's this war that is taking place. It's a story of creation and the war that made creation, that made all this happen. You're thinking, there's no war. 
happening here. I'm telling you, that's what Genesis 1 is about. It's about this battle scene, but you can't see it because you become so used to hearing a different narrative, maybe so anesthetized to it, to the, to the grittiness of this particular passage. It's a story told for a generation who needed to know that God was in control because what they're going through is trauma. So here come, here's, here's the fathers, right? Here's dad, here's papa, right? And little Yaakov and Abdiel, right? Good Hebrew names for a boy and girl are coming and they're around the fire and dad is gonna tell them a story. He's gonna tell them this ancient story with a new purpose. Okay, stories exist for centuries but they're coming around. The story that you have is written or edited, redacted, we call it, much later than you think it is. So the story you have is for a whole new purpose. And so he begins, of course, because he's a Hebrew, he's going to begin in Hebrew. And I've given you, if you've got your sheets there, right? I'm actually on the page to some degree, I think. I should look at this to see if I'm anywhere near there. Yes, a story was told in Babylon, told for a generation who needed to know that God was in control. What story? This story, Barashit bara Elohim et Hashemayim va et Haeretz. You guys all know that very well, right? But you probably do. You've heard it maybe in a different version. Maybe something is like, in the beginning, God created the heavens and the earth, right? There it is. Barashit, in the beginning, bara Elohim, God created the heavens, Hashemayim va Haeretz, and the earth. Okay, so this is where he's telling them this story. You're like, how is this a story? This is not a story about that. This is a story about the beginning of the universe. And it's, it's intended to make sure everybody knows that there's no evolution. Okay, probably not on the minds of the author in any way. Okay, they have a whole different political reason for writing this. Okay, it's an attack. It's a literary attack. They've got the guns out and they're blowing away the enemy here. Okay, so here's, it's, it's in five parts. You guys know this. Uh, the story that they're going to tell is going to be in five parts. Okay. Well, the whole story is going to be told in a whole lot of parts. The way that we organize it, it's going to be organized into 39 different parts, right? You guys follow what I'm saying? 39 different parts. There are 39 books of the Old Testament. Again, the way we organize it. So we have a first Samuel and a second Samuel. They don't have that. They got the book of Samuel. First King, second. Nope. Ezra. Nehemiah. Nope. Ezra and Nehemiah. Okay. So they have different numbering. Doesn't matter. Okay. It's the same, same canon. It's out there and it's Tanakh. So first one is the Torah. Okay. Okay. This is the Nevu'im. You don't, you probably don't care about the particular one there. And this is the Ketuvim. Okay. Got to give you some stuff to make you stretch for it. A little bit of Hebrew here. Ketuvim. All right, Torah, sometimes you guys say, we call that the law, right? That's the way we like to say it, law, law. okay? Horrible translation, probably should stop saying that the Torah is about the law. It does contain law and it is in some sense law, but when you think of law, you think of things that restrict you from doing stuff you wanna do, like a red light, I wanna go faster, I wanna get through this, it's stopping me, but that's not, like we need to get... Okay, but that's not, that's not the purpose of our class. Okay, the Nevoim and the Ketuvim. Nevoim just means prophets. I already told you that there's the former prophets and the latter prophets. Joshua, Judges, Kings, Samuel, former prophets. You guys, if you learned in, in growing up, you called them history, probably. But that's not the way that Hebrew thinks about that. These are the former prophets and the latter prophets. There's 12 plus the major prophets. So you've got the, the, four, the four former prophets. Samuel, Kings, Joshua, Judges, four. Then you've got the latter prophets and they are, how many of them? Let's see here, 12 plus three, right? So the three major prophets, why are they called major prophets? Because they're bigger. Oh, very smart group of people. Not more important, they're just long, okay? Nobody wants to read Ezekiel. When was the last time you read Ezekiel? Oh, right? So long. Okay. So there's 12. These are like the Haggai ones that we did, Habakkuk, Amos, the ones Zephaniah, like there's, who has any clue what Zephaniah is about? It's short even. We don't still don't know what it's about, but 12. Um, one of those that we call Daniel, 
right? We could, some people put that into the major prophets, but they're obviously not intelligent enough to understand that Daniel's a very short book and the other three are very long, so he can't be a major prophet. Also, he's not a prophet at all, right? Daniel actually goes into Ketuvim, into the writings. Okay, so just some basic background. This is Tanakh. Okay, this is how they call it. So they Tanakh, just they throw in some vowels there to make it pronounceable. It's kind of hard to think, right? So it's Tanakh, Torah, that's how it's all separated. This is going to tell you a story for a group of people who are in trauma. This is going to be their story. Very important to know that's coming from there. This is not about trying to battle science. Okay, this is people in trauma need this Genesis story, need this biblical story. Okay, so then we take this and we expand on it, right, so that we can understand it better. And you know the Pentateuch, right, or Torah, Genesis, Exodus, Leviticus, Numbers, Deuteronomy. Okay, there's some kind of argument as to whether Deuteronomy should be included in that or not, whether there's five or there's four, whether this is part of the Deuteronomistic history that is part of these or not. But that's a more scholarly debate that no one cares about. I mean, lots of people care about, but we don't have to care about it for the purposes of this. Okay, so there's a five-part series, that, and this Genesis chapter 1 through 11 is the intro to that five-part series. Okay, I'm going to argue for a five-point series, and that's it. It's done. Just like Star Wars, there's three movies. None of the others are worthy of being called Star Wars. It's kind of like Indiana Jones, right? There's only three. I don't care. The next one's, is it out coming this Friday or something? Did it just come out? Indiana Jones? You, please tell me somebody has a clue what I'm talking about. Indiana Jones is coming out soon. It's just like the, other than Star Wars, this is the other best one. Dun, 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 dun. Okay, anyway. Dun, 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 dun. Okay, so we have, um, so now the question is, what is God trying to say in this particular setting to these particular people? And here's what he's trying to say with all five of these, Genesis, Exodus, Leviticus, Numbers, Deuteronomy. He's trying to say, listen up, Israel. Yahweh is the creator of everything. Okay, I'm the creator because it's coming from God. It's coming from people. It's coming from God in some sense, right? God created everything, the whole cosmos. First, or so plus, plus that, not only did he create the cosmos, he redeems the cosmos or he redeems you people. That's Exodus. So he creates everything. He gives us a history. He redeems them from their place of um, captivity. So they're going to be freed and he's made you his people. He's your God. Worship only him. That's the rules. Okay. That's what this is all written to tell you. Worship only me. In fact, you might argue all the Bible is largely about that. Okay. Who should you worship? Oh, there's so many choices in the Bible. He keeps pulling us back. No, 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 let's, this is where we need to focus, focus here. Okay, it's the 10 commandments. It's the first two commandments. Only worship me, right? No, no other gods and no other objects that either represent me or represent others. That's not the way it works. Only me. So why must they worship God? Because he is creator and redeemer. Now, this concept, creation and redemption, is going to recapitulate through all of the Old Testament. There's going to be re recapitulate, right? Just it's going to keep doing it over and over again. Or you might say creation and then uncreation and then recreation. That theme is going to keep going. You're going to see it right here in the primeval history, just to get you started, right? He's going to create the world. He's going to do all this stuff. And then he's going to say, well, heck with that. Kill it all. And then he's like, okay, let's recreate again. Or that's what it looks like, doesn't it? Right? That's what the flood story is. It's an uncreation, but we'll get to that. We don't want to jump too far, far, far ahead. But creation and redemption. This is super important because this theme is also going to show up all the way into the New Testament. Okay. All the way back in Exodus, we have a creation story, right? God is creating his people or a redemption story. What I'm going to argue is that creation and redemption are actually one and the same thing. That's what's happening here. Okay, that he's, he's constantly doing this. He's uncreating and then recreating. So um, Exodus, 10 commandments. Why do, you, why, you, um, why do we worship on the Sabbath? What's the point of the Sabbath? According to Exodus, the reason that we do the Sabbath is because in six days, God created the world. And on the seventh day, he rested. 
You know where that's found, right? Right in this first chapter, which we've only gotten one verse into. Probably not going to get too much further than that. Okay, So you know that's what the creation story is about. But when you get to the book of Deuteronomy, they're going to ask the same question. Why? Why do we do the Sabbath? Abdiel and Yaakov are asking these questions. Why, why Papa, do we do the Sabbath? They're going to say something else. It's because God has redeemed us from Egypt. He's taken us. He's freed us from captivity. You're like, well, which one's the right answer? Did it, is it because he created the world in six days or is it because he redeemed us out of, out of Egypt? And the answer is yes, right? These are the same thing going on here, okay? In fact, you're going to see it consistently. God is constantly doing this. So when we wonder, why do we worship God, creator or redeemer? The answer is absolutely, okay? And when Jesus is, right, we call him a new creation, you're just like, well, Jesus isn't created. Let's get our theology right. No, no, no. It's symbolic. It's a, it's a, it's a movement that's going on. He's a new creation, like Noah was a new creation, like Abraham was a new creation, like Moses was a new creation. Jesus is a new creation. It doesn't mean he was created. It means there was something going on. There's a movement here where God is moving his people into this new area, this new realm. And Genesis 1 is one of those movements, one of those calls to say, I'm going to move you into this new space, okay? And you're going to find out there's nothing there right now, right? Literally nothing, verse two is going to tell us. But, okay, so here's what I'm saying. Um, let's see here. What am I saying? Uh, oh, let's just keep going. So important to realize that this story in the form we currently have it probably is not very early in time, okay? That is, it probably comes is written long after Moses. Okay, that shouldn't be super surprising because there's some stuff that happens in the Pentateuch that you're like, would Moses really write that? Right? Like, and Moses was the most humble man on the face of the earth. You're like, I don't know if the most humble man on the face of the earth would say something like I'm the most humble man on the face of the earth. Right? And it's like, it doesn't make a lot of sense. Right? And there's other text. and Moses died. Like, I don't know that Moses could write that. That would be a really hard one for him to write unless he's thinking future-wise, right? Or um, back in the days when there were no kings. Well, that would assume this is being written during the time when there are kings. So if you're reading Pentateuch, you're going to realize this is coming way later. At least pieces of this are coming way later. So I'm not saying that there's not some primitive narrative. There's not some creation story that starts off very early, right? But in its current form, the one that you're reading right now is probably very late. It's been redacted. It's flexible. And they've moved it. They've edited it. They've made it for a new group of people. So in the beginning, it looked like a certain thing. And then it changed for people under the time of the kings. Then it changed under people during the time of the exile, et cetera. So anytime someone asks me, what does this passage mean? I'm, I'm always asking the question, for who? What does it mean for who? And they're always thinking, for me. I'm like, well, it doesn't work that way. We got a lot of work before we can figure out what it means for you. Okay, first you got to remember what does it mean for the original writers, and then you got to ask questions like, well, what's an original writer? Like if Moses wrote little pieces of it, but he took it from other places, thousand years before that, some other pieces that he had, and then someone else came and edited. Who gets to be the original writer? What does that even mean? Okay, so we've got a lot of complexity to go through, but we're not going to do go through all that stuff. I just want you to know where it's written shapes its purpose where in chronology, where in time, and actually where in location geographically. Okay, it shapes its purpose. So if you decide to read Animal Farm, anybody have to read Animal Farm? Okay, good. A few yes, literary scholars here. Excellent. It's a very fun story about pigs getting up on two feet, using dogs to protect them, right? Super fun, running out the farmers, taking control of the farm. But if you understand a little bit more depth in that story, you're going to find out that, you know, this is a critique of Stalin's, uh, of Stalin in 1945, his regime. You're going to need to know Snowball is Lenin and Squealer is the newspaper and the dogs are the KGB. Like, you got to, you got to understand all that stuff. Now it's like, Bleh. so if you know where it's coming from in the time that it's written, then you can see all this other stuff. So Revelation, for instance, some of you are taking my class in Revelation on Tuesdays. That's the same thing. If you know where it's written, you can understand what's going on. It's not written for you. It's written for people 2,000 years ago and what they're dealing with. That's true of Genesis 2. So I have a little box there set on your paper that says the Old Testament is Israel's story written in light of national trauma, exile, 
to encourage continued faithfulness to God. So that's a pretty key thing. That's why I set it apart in a box there. The Old Testament is Israel's story written in light of national trauma, which is the exile, to encourage continued faithfulness to God. So that means I'm arguing, I'm not really making an argument. I'm just going to say, you have to trust me on this and we're going to move forward and I'll show you as we go whether, and you can determine whether I'm right or not, that this is written or at least heavily redacted during the time of the exile. That is 500 years before Jesus, not 1500 years before Jesus. It's pretty significant. Okay. So I'm saying, I don't think Moses wrote this. I think Moses had a piece of it. I think several of these stories would fit very well into Moses's timeline and are written for his people, but over time they've moved, they've shifted, and they're actually being told for this new group of people, this new story where Babylon is in control. This really fits well if you think about it, Genesis 1 through 11. What's the last story in Genesis 1 through 11? The calling of Abram is chapter 12, but yes, kind of. What happens right before that though? Yep, but what's the big story that happens right before? You're 100% you're right, but the Babel, that's what I was looking for, thank you. You have to actually know what I'm thinking in order to be able to give it, but he's not wrong at all. But Babel, right, which is just, oh, we just say the Tower of Babel, but you know what the tower is, right? This is the creation of Babylon. This is the story of Babylon being created. Okay, so, and so it's this, it's this polemic, this, I will fight you, okay? So that's mine. No, somebody else's. Okay, so if you think that this story is all about creation ex nihilo, okay, we, we've taught you Hebrew. We've got to teach you some Latin too, right? So ex nihilo, if I could write it in italics, I would, but I don't know how to do that. All right, creation ex nihilo, which just means out of nothing. Okay, then you're going to be missing something in the story. That's not what's going on. Just, just in case anybody gets concerned, I'm not saying the world isn't created out of nothing. I don't have any idea. Well, actually, I have a pretty good idea because there are other passages that talk about it. Right? I'm just saying this passage couldn't care less about that question. So there's all kinds of theology you can still hold on to, even as I take your proof texts away from you, All right, which I'm hoping to do. I'm hoping to take some of your... your I was like, well, it's out of nothing, right? God just spoke and then it existed. Uh, I'm, not, I'm not sure that's exactly what's happening. Okay, so if you want to hold on to creation next in Hilo, you have to go to John 1, you have to go to Colossians, maybe Hebrews, but probably not Hebrews because that's making out of it something invisible. That's something completely different than nothing. But whatever, I'm just saying that's not what the text is trying to do here. So let's focus on what the actual text is trying to do. It's not out of nothing. Okay. It's just not, it's like saying that they would try, they're trying to defeat Darwin. Okay. Moses is not trying to defeat Darwin. Moses is never, we're just pretending Moses is the author, right? Moses never heard of Darwin. Darwin doesn't exist for many, many, many centuries. Okay. That's not an argument. Nobody out there believes that the earth just started on its own and became became better and better and like you know one cell animals nobody thought that way i'm not arguing whether it's true or not i'm just saying in the time of the bible nobody thought that way the gods of course created the world either a god or gods everyone thought that way so it's not an argument against that the babylonians thought that the egyptians thought that everyone thought everyone has a creation story so israel has one too so israel's writing their creation story to tell you something different not to argue against science, but to tell you that those Babylonians, those Egyptians, those whoever, they got it all wrong. Okay, it's a literary war against these people. And it's not in the beginning. Okay, so we start off very early, right? So we got um, better sheets. Uh, that's not helpful to you. Better sheets. That's not helpful to you. Um, in the beginning. Okay, and then it just kind of stops. I don't know if you're aware of that because you just are used to saying in the beginning, God created the heavens and the earth, right? But it's actually in the beginning of something. It requires an, a beginning of, but there's nothing here. So it's grammatically just not good. It's bad grammar, okay? In the beginning of something, but it's not in the beginning of something because, or it's not, at least it's not the beginning of creation because there's something there 
when we get to verse two, we have this parenthetical statement, right? So in the beginning, he creates heavens and earth, or we already have some questions here, by the way, right? This could be sky and land, as it often is. In fact, Eretz Israel, okay, Eretz, the land of Israel, land, okay? Not earth, planet. When you hear earth, you think planet, they're thinking sky and land, probably, okay? But when we get to verse two, we're going to find, in the beginning. I've always, in the, beginning. in the beginning, we have this creation story going on. Oh, you remember Magis Magician's Nephew? Anybody read Magician's Nephew? This is, you remember the, uh, there's this great scene where Aslan starts singing, right? And then things start sprouting. <laughs> Even the lampstand. So remember the piece that some of you have no, well, I have no idea what you're, but the lamp, the, the piece of the lamp was thrown by the woman in the real world into, into Narnia and it landed in the snow or the ground or whatever. And, got, and he starts singing and the lamp post grows. Like it grows up and it's this beautiful, like Aslan is singing in the great creation. That's what's going on here. Anyway, okay. So thank you for whoever gave me my music in the background. I like that. Okay, so um, here it is. It, our, 2,500 years ago, they're reading this. I'm gonna read my translation. Hopefully you've got a version of yours, right? So yours says something like, in the beginning, God created the heavens and the earth. Mine would probably, knowing a little bit more Hebrew, would say something like, in the beginning, when God was creating the heavens and the earth, okay? Which gives it a little bit of a different tone right? Like, meanwhile, while God was creating the heavens and the earth, and then we're going to hear this next spot, the earth was formless and empty, or I don't know what yours says, uh, without form and void, something like that. You guys, good King James people, okay? Um, darkness was over the sur surface of the deep, and the spirit of God, or that word spirit is just ruach. Ruach means, um, well, it can be in spirit, could mean wind, sometimes even breath, okay, or the spirit of God. It could even be a superlative, like mighty, like if you put it before something, the spirit of God, like the, the mighty or something. I mean, there's all kinds of stuff that could be happening there. Was hovering, okay, or uh, flapping, flapping. It's a, a bird can do this. It's actually used uh, very, not coincidentally, in, we can't make all the connections in the world, unfortunately, but the angel who's in Passover is hovering over the doors that have been painted in blood, right? So it's just this, this background. Okay, so hovering over the waters, um, the tehom or the deep there. Okay, so now, uh, what do I want to say here? Actually, let's see what I, what did I give you guys? Let's see what I said here. Okay, merism darkness, deep, to home. Okay, so I already, I already planned ahead as to what I would say here. All right, so a merism is just a cool literary device. It's basically saying God created these things, and now we're going to specify what that looks like. It's kind of like a soup to nuts, like everything that happens. So some people would say this is a merism, that God created all these things. <laughs> is that coming out of there? Oh, weird. Okay. All right, I can, I can, I can focus. All right, um, or, or again, the sky and the land. So that's the merism question. Okay. So the other three oh, ones were darkness. So hoshek. Okay. So I, I want you to feel what what they're feeling at this time in this second verse. Okay. I want you to feel the tohu vabohu, or the the formless and void. I want you to feel the hoshek. I want you to feel the tahom, the sea, or the deep, the abyss, it's sometimes called. Same word, actually, in the New Testament and in Revelation, when the keys to the abyss have been opened, okay, or to the sea, to the waterland. I need you to feel what the look is at this time, okay? This is really important. So what, what's not happening is a creation story out of nothing. What's happening is a molding story out of something. So instead of, I like to think of it, instead of building a house, God is building a home. You know the difference between those two things, right? That's a big difference. When you move into a new house, 
Okay, you didn't create it. Some of you probably did. Some of you actually built it, did all that stuff, but most of us didn't. We moved into something and then we created in it a home. And that first day is miserable, isn't it? Like you move all those things in there, boxes up to the ceiling. You've got, you, you praise the Lord that mattresses couldn't have been boxed up because now at least you've got a mattress, but now you got to find the sheets, right? That's the first thing that has to happen because you're going to go to sleep. It's going to be two o'clock in the morning, but you're going to go to sleep at some point. You got to find the sheets and they're ready. So you've got that, you got a pillow. Okay. And the next morning you start moving things, you start shifting things, right? You're just moving everything out of the way so that you can live. Because what we have here in the house is absolute chaos for a little while. And what the job to do and to make it into a home is to make it livable, right? To make it ordered to get there, okay? So tohu vabohu, let's, let's do that one. All right, everyone has to turn to their neighbor and say, tohu vabohu, go ahead. This is gonna be your new super cool word. You're gonna be... So glad that I taught you this word, okay? Actually, it's several words. Tohu va bohu, okay? You might hear it a little bit different sometimes. You might hear it as va vohu because the B and the V are kind of, they're, they're the same letter. They just, they're pronounced differently. Depend, anyway, it doesn't, doesn't matter. This word is the word and. This one is, so tohu is means like um, wild. If we're gonna stick with the rhyming, we at least use alliteration. It's not some, some literary feature to help you remember. Wild and waste, tohu vabohu. It's just a word that means chaos. It's not a word, it's a, it's a phrase, a, a together thing. Okay, there's chaos here, it's a mess. It's tohu vabohu. So now when you come home and your kids and the place is what happened here? This is tohu vabohu, okay? And they'll be like, I have no idea. She's going insane. Maybe the spirit's talking through her, right? Or him, okay? That, that's what's happened. This is, this is chaos. So the first chapter is not about creating out of nothing. It's molding out of something, turning the chaos into order. And that, so that's the formless and void thing, okay? So here's, here's what it looks like. With this plus the word hoshek, um, darkness, let me give you a picture of what it is. You guys have been to the beach, right? I mean, every single person here has been to the beach. You're like two and a half hours away from it, right? Okay. And of course, if you're brave, you're going to be in the water, I hope. And you're going to be either body surfing or you're going to be raft surfing or you're going to be actual surfing. Okay. And at some point, if you're doing those things, you're going to wipe out. I assume you've wiped out once before in your life and you're kind of rolling around. You kind of hit the ground, right? You hit the sand. It's not terrible. I mean, depending on how big the, big the wave is, but you're, you hit this and, and you're kind of rolling around and the dirt's all hitting you in the face, right? It's the, the sand's hitting you in the face. And for at least one second, you have no idea which way is up, right? And you're just kind of like, okay, but things settle after like three seconds usually. And then you can stand up depending on how far out you were. You're like, ah, okay. And you have to stand up because what will happen if you stay down? You will die, right? Because you can't breathe down there. Okay, so that moment, that one second, that's tohu vabohu. Okay, so here's mankind. Okay, doesn't exist yet. We're in verse two. There's no mankind, but just pretend. Okay, tohu vabohu is this. Right? That's what it is. It's a complete mess. And the whole plan that God has is to create his representative. Genesis 1 26. Let us make man in our image. In the image of God, he created them, male and female. Remember all this, right? That image idea is where we're headed, but we can't do it like this because this is what the earth looks like right now. So what God has to do is he's got to start creating, forming, molding. He's got to get the place ready. He's got to start ordering things. So if you are, um, Anna said she was reading. Did you read Pete Enns this week? Okay. All right. So there, he's got an illustration in there, which I like. I think, I think it was him that did this, right? When you are, um, if you want to, you guys play games, anybody board games? Okay. And you remember when you had kids in your, in your house, lots of kids maybe, and you want to play board games and the place is kind of messy. You're like, I want to, I, I, I want to build my hotels, right? I want to put Monopoly. I got my 500s. I'm ready. I'm going to, I'm going to crush all the competition. But before you can build your hotels, what do you got to do? 
you got to find a place to put this, play this game. And if you've got little kids, that's probably not norm. Like it's not easy to do. Like we're going to do it on the kitchen table. No, because there's still like peanut butter and jelly from when they were making lunch this morning and syrup that's just sticky. And you so, so you got to start working, right? You got to start scrubbing the table. You got to clear off all the stuff, put the stuff on the mount, mantelpiece or whatever in order to be able to build what you want to build. So the first three days are this is this preparation. That's what God's doing in the first three days of creation so that he can put his things into it. So he, in order to get his creation, right? His new creation, mankind, his image bearer, the one who's going to represent him on earth, he's got to start getting the world ready for it. So this is what he's doing. He's conquering the chaos, but there's more because chaos isn't just this watery mess. In their minds, there's a literary thing going on here. They have this whole understanding of what's happening in their time is, is this list of gods who have created the world and are out to rule it and you. Okay, so the author of Genesis 1 is picking a fight. I'll put it like that. Okay, he's picking a literary fight. He's going to rip into all these other creation myths, and there are lots of them out there. So, for instance, we get to verse 3. We'll come back to verse 2 often because it's so key to understanding everything else, but I want to get just a little bit further. Verse 3, right? This is where he says, let there be light. God said, let there be light, and there was light. Okay. God saw that light was good, separated the light from the darkness. So he's doing some separation work. God called the light day and the darkness he called night, evening, morning, day one, first day. Okay, notice, no sun, moon, stars, right? First day, just light. Like, well, the way you have light is sun, moon, and stars. That's right. But there's no light. There's no sun, moon, and stars. Very important. It's not until what day do we get sun, moon, and stars? Day four, hugely significant as to when we get these days. One, that's not going to be helpful to anybody. One, light. Four, uh, sun. Okay. By the way, it's going to keep going like this. Two, water. Five, um, flying things and swimming things. Three, water again. I'll explain all this. And then day six, man and animals. Okay, there's a structure going on in this chapter. It's really significant. Because if you're thinking that day one takes place before day four, because that's the way chronology works, you're missing the literary aspects of this. They're not trying to do that. Just like if you're reading the book of Revelation and you think chapter 19 comes before chapter 20, because obviously 19 comes before 20, you're missing the way Revelation is organized. There's this movement. They're constantly telling you the same story over and over again in the book. Don't read it chronologically or you'll be doomed. If you read Daniel chronologically, you're going to find that he's in one king is over top of him here, and then it's another king, and then the other king came back. It's like, what just happened? Okay, don't read it chronologically. It's not what it's designed to do. It's meant to be read thematically. The Gospels, don't read them chronologically. They're thematic. Okay, so this is true in Genesis 2. It's doing all of this as well. So when we get to um, verse 14, we have day four. And God said, let there be lights in the expanse of the sky to separate the day from the night. Let them serve as signs to mark seasons and days and years. And let them be lights in the expanse of the sky to give light on the earth. And it was so. God made two great lights, the sun and the moon. Well, that's actually not what he says, does he? God made two great lights, the greater light to govern the day and the lesser light to govern the night. He also made the stars. Just a side comment. He also made the stars. God set them in expanse of the sky and give light on the earth to govern the day and the night and to separate light from darkness. And God saw that it was good and there was evening and morning the fourth day. So I say this is about picking a fight. I'm guessing you probably didn't pick up on the fight scene yet, but remember if they're sitting in Babylonian worship services, okay, or those people around them are worshiping these Babylonian gods who loved astrology, who loved to worship things that were up in the heavens, and they had names for the sun and the moon and the stars. In fact, in everybody's world, pretty much, these were worshiped things. The stars may have even been the hosts of heaven. 
even in our own Bible, it sometimes calls the stars host of heaven, right? That is the armies. Host just means armies. The armies, these are angels. These are beings. And sometimes they're moving. You see them moving, right? But they, they're, they're understanding. Think primitively. Think the way they're thinking about all these things. Okay, so, but he, this, this author, does not give these beings any kind of personality. He doesn't even call them sun and moon, right? Ra or Kanshu, right? He doesn't call them by these things. He instead calls them greater light and lesser light. Oh, and also there are some stars. Okay, this is, this is a, do you, do you hear the war happening here? This little battle, it's kind of a fight that he's having with the Babylonian authors because there's already creation stories out there and their creation stories have the sun and the moon being super powerful. These are things that are worthy of worship, not in this world. In God's story, in Moses' story, in the Babylonian Papa story that he's telling the story of, that's not what's happening, right? These are just things that God created, extra things that you need. I already had light, but I'm going to use these things to govern it. I'm going to take the sun and the moon, but we don't call them the sun. We'll call them greater light, lesser light, which is kind of a little jab. Like, yeah, you guys are, you guys are nothing, right? Who is supposed to be worshipped as creator and redeemer? Yahweh alone. Okay, it's a jab. It's this literary jab that's happening here. And God said, let there be an expanse between the waters to separate water from water. I'm on verse six. Sorry, I didn't tell you where I was. Let there be an expanse in the waters to separate water from water. So God made the expanse and separated the water under the expanse from the water above it. And it was so, and he called the expanse sky, and there was evening and there was morning the second day. So on day two, He's taking the water and he's separating it like this, okay? Because here's, we got all this. So first of all, it's all dark. And then he makes, I don't know, maybe some, a little bit lighter in here. So we can see, okay, we don't, we don't have a, we don't have a division of every 24 hours or every 12 hours. That's not taking place yet, but it's a little bit lighter. And then he's going to say, okay, let's separate it. Okay, so now we've got messiness up here, messiness down here. So we can create mankind, pedagogical necessity here, right? Except for he can't fly. So that's a problem, right? Because now he's just going, ah! okay, he's still going to die down here. So that's not what we, we want. We don't want this to happen yet. So he's creating an expanse, a rakia, something here to hold up the waters above and the waters below so that there's something, an expanse so that they can breathe, so they can do this stuff. So... Now there's this, I have like four minutes. Okay, assuming that one in the back is right. So Anuma Elish, you guys, you guys know this book? You should, everyone should read Anuma Elish just for fun. I don't care if you do, I was just kidding. Anuma Elish is a Babylonian creation story, okay? It looks amazingly like our creation stories. There's a bunch of other ones, Atrahasis, there's the Sumerian flood epic, there's all kinds of things out there that are older than our Bible. They exist before ours. Ours is probably speaking into these other myths. You think it works like this or like this or like this? Oh, let me tell you the real story. Okay, and so this real story is going to fight against these other stories. In a, and when I say real, I mean the story that I, I want to persuade you of. Right? The, the fact is, God, some gods created the world. That's going to be true in their mind. But they're trying to make sure you know that these gods, the Babylonian gods, the Sumerian gods, the Egyptian gods, whatever these other gods are, they're not the gods that we care about. Right? They're not the ones that really did it. In fact, they're not even gods. They're not even worthy of worshiping. God created them to begin with. That's, that's what they're trying to get to. So he calls the expanse, uh, Scott, oh, sorry, Anuma Elish. So Anuma Elish is the story about, it's this giant soap opera of uh, a god whose name is Marduk, not Marmaduke, in case you're thinking about the big god, that's not, Marduk, who is fighting against his great-grandmother, Tiamat. Tiamat, if you've watched the Marvel movies, it's in the Eternals. Tiamat is one of the names of one of those things, um, and they've taken it from these ancient Babylonian myths. Okay, Tiamat is a dragon, a great sea serpent. By the way, sea serpents are going to show up all the way through the Bible. Okay, they have all kinds of different names. Leviathan, um, uh, Yam, uh, Rahav, right? They're going to keep showing up all throughout. These sea creatures, seven heads usually, okay? And so this, that's what this is. 
Okay, so there's this Tiamat monster. This is a Babylonian myth, right? It's not in the Bible, but it shows up in the Bible. Okay, and so in this particular Babylonian myth, um, Marduk is going to go to war against his great grandmother. I don't know what's going on. Great grandmother's not letting him watch TV. Whatever the case is, um, he's going to fight against this evil creature. He's going to fillet her, basically cut her from straight down the middle, right? And he's going to put half of the half of up in the heavens and half down on down below. And mankind will be down here once mankind is created, and the and the heavenlies will be populated with the gods. Okay, so we've got these two different things. So this is what so so in their world, that's what they're thinking. So when God creates a rakia, right? Here's good a good literary move for me. Uh, sorry, a pedagogical move for me. Okay, when he creates this rakia which is a dome, like a, I know I'm movie-addled brain, but um, Captain America's shield, right? This, this, this iron, steel, I don't know what it is. Oh, it's vibranium, titanium, uh, adamantium alloy, but whatever, okay? He takes this piece of metal and he puts it up in the heavens, okay? To block the waters from coming down. Okay? It's, just a, it's just a thing. It's a rakia. It's not, it's not Tiamat. Okay, Tiamat, the gods. No, no, no. These are just things that God created and God uses in order to create his creation. Everything's this little jab that he's doing when he says all these things. Even the word tehom in, in uh, the very first part, in uh, the, the, the abyss, right? Tehom has as its roots the word Tiamat. It's in there if you look. Okay, but it's been demythologized. It's like, we're not going to give it any credit for anything. At this point, it's just a word that means abyss but it's a little tiny jab as we keep using these words and we keep saying these things in these ways. So he's saying, I don't care about your sun and moon gods. That doesn't matter to me. They're not, they're not real gods. I don't care about your Tiamat God. I don't care about any of these other gods of the sun or the moon, like any, anything else that's out there. The God who's created the world, the God that needs to be worshiped is named Yahweh. That's where they're going to get to. I can't get into that now because we got to eat snacks and go to worship. But that's where we go to next. Um, you, you'll see, we'll, we'll stick, we'll go somewhere under that. Uh, I don't like your Marduk or Tiamat God in case there's something there that I need to re-explain. Rakia is very important. That dome, uh, I should say this, that, do that Captain America shield. Think about it. I think Pete says this too. Um, think about it like a, a snow globe but the water's on the outside. That's what God's doing, okay? He's creating a snow globe and he's saying, here, it's a place for you to be able to breathe. What he's done so far is he's made light somehow and he's separated the waters from the waters. What he still needs to do is separate the waters this way so that dry ground can appear, right? Otherwise he can't put his representative there, which is the key to it all. The representative has to be able to represent him in the world over the animals and all the others, right? And the representative is, is so important to understanding what's happening in Genesis, what the image of God is. All right. Go blessings on you. Yeah, I don't know, whatever. Love you guys. Thank you for listening. Barry, you can interrupt me more next time. I'm sorry. I was very excited. <laughs>